early presidents of Islam in America and those pioneers and activists that made it happen. And it entails my life growing up in Jim Crow South. Can you believe that? I was born in 1950s, the early 50s, in a segregated society, marginalized as a person of color and ostracized because I was a Muslim. I can recall going to segregated schools, drinking from fountains that said colors only and prohibited from drinking from fountains that said white only. I grew up in a society that there's only three types of people, black, white, and the other. I can recall going to restaurants where we had to take our food from the window, theaters where we had to go to the top and look down. That's, that's my experience. So I think that I started my activism the day I was born because I was challenged with the society to claim my humanity. So inside of the book, Color Me Muslim, is sold out, mashallah, it was actually a, a guide and an inspiration for young Muslims who are struggling and trying to navigate in a non-Muslim society such as America. I migrated to New York and New Jersey in my early teens. I entered into a culture that was uh, infested, replete with drugs and all types of violence, gang activity, etc. And it was my Islam. It was my Islam that, that kept my moral compass uh, afloat. Also, uh, I am the co-author of the book, I Buried Malcolm. This is the book that my father wrote, and we're gonna talk about that a little in my lecture today, as he actually championed uh, the cause, despite threats against his life, to perform the jaznaza for El Hajj Shabazz. I am also the author of Bilal Ibn Rabah, Racism and Colorism in Islam. Uh, actually going back to antiquity and uh, classic texts to, to actually identify where racism and colorism entered into Islam and also the history of Islam in America. My latest piece is what everyone asks at the end of my lectures, who really killed Malcolm? So I'm actually going to be actually publishing this book, inshallah ta'ala, uh, in the latter part of the summer, inshallah. So it will be available uh, for those who are interested. <clears throat> Also, I do work beyond uh, the East Coast. I'm also the Imam of O Block. I don't know if you heard of O Block, show of hands. It's one of the most dangerous uh, uh, communities in America, believe it. Uh, actually, uh, I go into O Block uh, uh, unescorted. And uh, alhamdulillah, we have about 40 shahadas. And of course, you see them making the salah inside of the, the courtyards. And this is the work we are doing there. Uh, Islam making a difference in their lives really making a difference in their lives. And of course, uh, there are some people in, in these photos that have bounties on their heads that can't go beyond their own block, uh, uh, unsecured, and alhamdulillah, they are accepting Islam. And we have the, 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 the saying that uh, we are unapologetically Muslim and there's no man left behind. So we reach deep into the gutter. Those people who are down try to reject it and look down upon, and we bring Islam to them. So that's some of the work that I do. And of course, I am a Malcolm scholar uh, by default because of the relationship that my father had in this uh, social justice movement and uh, his relationship with Elahaj Malik Shabazz that led up to his assassination. And tonight, I want to talk about one of the most profound activists in the history of my time. It's probably history to you because if anyone born before 1965, show of hands. So this is history. To me, it is an ongoing experience, a continuum. It's a continuum. Now, I asked the question, who heard about Malcolm? Show of hands. I don't want you to go to sleep, so I want some movement, some, some, some real alertness here. So everyone heard about Malcolm. Now, who really knows Malcolm? Show of hands. Okay, we're gonna go through that. I like that, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Now, we must realize that Malcolm X, or Malcolm Little, Malcolm X, Big Red, Malik Shabazz, El Haj Malik Shabazz, are different dimensions and transformations of his life. Malcolm reinvented himself more than one time. And of course, if Malcolm is history to you, you probably learn about him through newspaper clippings, possibly purchase a few books on his life, and of course, we have the Malcolm Bible, the autobiography of Malcolm X, 
by Alex Haley. I say as told by Alex Haley, and we'll get into that. So that's how you know about Malcolm. But believe it or not, none of those books that you see on the screen were written by Muslims. So there's a missing chapter about al Haj Malik Shabazz. And it takes a Muslim to articulate that transformation when he reached his full development. And we're going to talk about that. Now, Alex Haley, supposed to have been a ghostwriter. Anyone here in journalism, show of hands? Great. So as you grow, grow, uh, a ghostwriter does not interfere with the, with the narrative. They just take the information, they make it uh, uh, reader-free, edit it, so forth and so on. And uh, actually, when Alex Haley wanted to do the story, that was his first big project, uh, Malcolm said, I only trust you 75%. Alex Haley was a Republican, and Malcolm was, at that time, a black nationalist and a pan-Africanist, meaning that they had uh, contradicting views. So that was a bad start from the beginning. Not only that, there were missing chapters from the book. Okay, as you can see, chapter 15, the Negro was never inserted in the book. Not only that, you can see the editing of the manuscript that Alex himself would redline and try to find soft words that would be politically correct to actually put in the book so that uh, it would not be controversial or too far out of, of, of reach from the, from the reader. So of course, we know that the book wasn't published until after Malcolm's assassination. And that's, that became problematic as well. So I'm saying this to say that as a forensic historian and a, a, a literary critic, that there are some missing things in the book, and I'm actually going to see where they are in this part. Now, for those who know Malcolm, we're going to actually introduce a new Malcolm tonight, inshallah ta'ala. The book itself, as we know, is 527 pages. It has 19 chapters. And only three chapters in the book captures Malcolm's life as a Muslim. Can you imagine that? And there's only about, what, uh, 82 pages that does that, and... Alex Haley, he wrote the epilogue, meaning that he made a summary or summation of Malcolm's life based on his uh, 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 views, and he projected Malcolm to the society through his own lens. So maybe that's not the Malcolm that I know or you knew, and we're going to talk about that. Now, Malcolm X, the movie, show of hands, who saw the movie? Three hours and 27 minutes. They had to have intermission, I'm sure. Spike Lee was the director of the movie. Do you know Spike Lee did not write the screenplay? Anyone knew that? The screenplay was written in 1975. You know why Spike Lee was chosen to be the director? Because the movie was being released during the Rodney King era. You remember the Rodney King era in, in, in California? So it would not have been politically correct for a white American to direct a movie about El Haj Malik Shabazz. As, of course, you can see, that's me and Spike Lee sitting there uh, uh, in, uh, in an affair. And because I was actually supposed to be cast in the movie. I was actually supposed to play my father, OK? And of course, I always tell Spike, you know, you owe me $80,000, OK? But he. Uh, he cut the budget short, and he actually used uh, original film clipping. I don't know if you saw at the end of the person standing at the grave and doing the, the janazah for al Hajmi Shabbat. That was my father, and they didn't mention his name. And we're going to talk about why they didn't mention his name. Okay, now, there was a missing cast in that movie. You know, there was a missing cast. Can anyone recognize any person in that cast? Yes. He was Prince Faisal, but he actually became the king a few months later. Yes, yes. This is King Faisal. That's correct. Anyone else? Okay. So we're going to get into who really know Malcolm. Okay. I'm going to go through the cast real fast. The first person you see is Ella Collins. That was Malcolm's sister. Ella Collins was the one who took Malcolm in as a second mother when he became delinquent as a teenager in Boston. 
brought him in, and of course, Malcolm didn't stop there. He ended up in uh, crime and, and, and things of that nature, and he landed a prison sentence. However, she is the one, right, that paid for Malcolm's pilgrimage to Mecca. She had saved up money for herself to go make the pilgrimage, and Malcolm wanted to go, so she gave him her savings, and Malcolm made the pilgrimage. Not only that, she was the one who paid for Malcolm's janaza when he was assassinated. She took money and paid for that. Not only that, she was the one that was in charge of the Muslim mosque incorporated for the distribution of the scholarships after Malcolm's assassination. Not only that, the Ella Collins Institute is in the Boston Islamic Center honoring her. So she was a very, very profound person in Malcolm's life, but she was not in the movie. Not only that, um, in regards to reviewing the movie, she, she was very disappointed as the way it turned out because it didn't capture Malcolm. Malcolm. And of course, uh, uh, my father used to visit her annually, and my brother used to sleep in Malcolm's bed. That's how close we were connected to the family. The next person is Akbar Muhammad. Anyone heard of Akbar Muhammad? Akbar Muhammad was Elijah Muhammad's youngest son. He defected from the nation of Islam, which is a pseudo uh, deviant type of Islam. And that was his son. He, he, he defected from that. He came on the Shahada. As far as scholarship for indigenous Americans, he attained a PhD in, in all the Islamic sciences. And he served on the, the Fiqh Council of America, or the American Fiqh Council. But he was not in the movie. He is the one who reprimanded Malcolm for calling people Uncle Tom's and bad names. And he encouraged Malcolm to, to leave the Nation of Islam and join in the greater civil rights movement in America. But he's not cast in the movie, okay? And you can see him and his brother, uh, Imam Wadadim Muhammad, at an early age on the left, being taught by Jamil Diab from Al Quds through Islam. But he's not in the movie. And also we have... Uh, Ahmed Uthman, he's still alive, he's in the Maryland area there. He is from Sudan, and he was the one who challenged Malcolm uh, uh, beliefs when he was about 21 years old. He was a student, and he went by temple number seven, and he challenged Malcolm. And he was the one who stayed in contact with Malcolm throughout Malcolm's life, uh, trying to help Malcolm make that transition to Islam. Not only that, he is the one who took Malcolm to take his shahada. He is the one who organized Malcolm's pilgrimage to Mecca. He is the one who read the eulogy upon Malcolm's ass assassination. Also, he's the one who accompanied Betty Shabazz one month after Malcolm's assassination to make her pilgrimage while she was pregnant with two children, with twins in her stomach. But yet, he was not cast in the movie. The next person is Sheikh Ahmed Dawood Faisal. Anyone here from Brooklyn, show of hands. Brooklyn, okay, Brooklyn in the house. Uh, we know we have the Islamic, uh, the Islamic Mission of America right there in the State Street. It's called the State Street Masjid. It was established in the 1930s. And that is Sheikh uh, Dawood uh, Faisal. He was a mentor to Malcolm. He was also instrumental in, in Malcolm's transition from Orthodox Islam to uh, uh, Sunni Islam. As you can see, that's a, a leadership meeting that they held in Brooklyn. And you see over the guy with the yellow over his head, it says Brother X. Malcolm was invited to that movie, that meeting, but he knew that it was illegal for a nation of Islam to attend Sunni gathering, so he sent a representative. He was not cast in the movie. And of course, uh, in the movie, Malcolm was called Big Red. You remember Shorty in the movie? Anyone remember Shorty? Spike Lee played Shorty, the little guy. But there was the reason why he was called Shorty, because his name was Malcolm Javis, and Malcolm's name was Malcolm Little. So Malcolm was about 6'3", and Shorty was like that, so they called him Shorty as a result. And they were studying Islam, right, before Malcolm met uh, Elijah Muhammad in a very early stage. And I'm not going to, these are actually billboard uh, slides here, so I'm not going to get into that for the sake of time. <clears throat> also, uh, Malcolm was in touch with uh, Abdul Basit Naeem, uh, who actually uh, promoted the Nation of Islam uh, secretly, uh, trying to get representation from the Muslim World League 
So they would actually put the, uh, the Nation of Islam materials in their uh, journal, not letting the people know from a global level that they weren't really Muslim to gain recognition as though they was doing dawah work in America. And of course, that was funded heavily by some of the uh, Gulf states. Anyone familiar with Muhammad Surur Sabban? Anyone familiar with him? Do you know that his family was a sla were slaves in Saudi Arabia? And slavery wasn't abolished in Saudi Arabia until 1962? Could you imagine that? Anyone knew that? That slavery uh, uh, persisted in Saudi Arabia until 1962. And it was Prince Faisal himself who forced the emanuation of slaves in that society. And uh, uh, Muhammad Surur Sabban, his family was slaves to the Saban family. However, it wasn't like chattel slavery in Jim Crow South. He was educated. He became the assistant minister of finance. And also, he was a journalist and an activist. And he was the one who actually financed uh, 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 Malcolm's Muslim Mosque Incorporated. He is the one who paid for Malcolm's personal teacher, uh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed Hassoun. But he's not cast in the movie. And he also is the one who awarded Malcolm the scholarships for his organization. Yuri Kochiyama, anyone heard of her? Show of hands, come on, let's, let's, let's not go to sleep. Okay, Yuri Kochiyama was the only person that was not of color that was a member of the OAAU, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. She was Japanese and she was a social activist because her family during World War II was interred in the concentration camps for two years and her father died as a result of that containment. And she came out and she joined Malcolm's movement. And she was the one on stage when Malcolm was assassinated screaming, please Malcolm, Malcolm stay alive. Okay, and she secretly took Shahada in 1971. And she used to go to the first Muslim prison in New York to pray the Juma. It's called the Sankori Masjid. It's there today, the first uh, Muslim mosque, a prison mosque. And that's where she, she was down to earth, but she wasn't actually cast in the movie at all. And of course, our dear Sheikh Ahmed Hassoun, who studied and taught 33 years in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, and he was appointed as Malcolm's personal teacher. Personal teacher. And he was actually on the stage the day Malcolm was assassinated. I call it an execution because they made sure that his family was there when they, when they assassinated him. It was a, 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 a planned uh, uh, assassination. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So Spike Lee did not cast any of these people in the movie because it would have changed the narrative and it would have changed the dynamics of who Malcolm really was in his full development. Also, Maya Angelou, anyone heard of Maya Angelou? Okay, yes, yeah, she was a poet and she was a, 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 an author. Do you know she never finished high school? And she taught American studies at Duke University in North Carolina. She was self-learned, subhanAllah. And actually she was an expatriate, meaning that she had actually left America and took up residence in Ghana. Okay, a lot of us was trying to escape racial persecution and oppression left and went abroad, okay? Either we went to Turkey or we went to Egypt or we went to Ghana, okay? And she actually, along with W. Du Bois and his wife Shirley, was expatriates and they were in Ghana. And when Malcolm went there and they connected, she herself came back and joined the Organization for Afro-American Unity. And she was very, very instrumental and organizing Malcolm's travels to Africa, so forth and so on. And of course, as my brother mentioned, King Faisal, but at that particular time, he was Prince Faisal, and again, I mentioned that uh, slavery had just ended. Uh, Malcolm was in Mecca in 1964. Slavery had just ended in 1962, so sometimes I wondered the conversation that they had. Could you imagine that? And also, this is Sheikh Mohammed Ali al Harakan. He was the person who actually took Malcolm off the plane when Malcolm landed in Jeddah to make the pilgrimage because it's not like today where you go online, Nusukh, and you get a visa, they don't screen you, and everybody going to Mecca, and they are, they, are, they, are, they are doing selfies saying, look, I thought only Muslims would come to Mecca, subhanAllah. At that time, you had to go to the Hajj course if there was some discretion about your Islam. And they would ask you, 
numerous of questions. And of course, that was the judge that Malcolm actually ended up going in his courts in Jeddah. And I had, on another situation, I ended up in his courts as well in 1980, but it wasn't for a, a, a critique of my Islam. It was something bigger than that, mashallah. Um, and of course, Malcolm himself saw the relationship of Africans and Arabs, you know, because he saw that people of color all over the globe was being oppressed, was trying to decolonize their countries and bring in sovereign states to rule themselves. And he saw that the Africans and the Arabs and the black Americans, for better choice of words, was going through the same struggle. Very, very powerful, energized experience. The 60s was the, I would say, the highest tier of social justice. You know, I mean, we really were in the streets. I mean, you know, we go through the streets for, for Philistine and the people of Gaza. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of those who have raised their voices. But we did this on a day-to-day, -day, uh, 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 what we call schedule. Somewhere at any time in the United States of America, we were protesting, we was having conflicts with the, with the law enforcement, or we were burning down cities. We were on the move, okay? Now, I buried Malcolm. Why is this book important? Because we say, you know, everybody writes books about Malcolm. As I mentioned earlier, that none of those books are written by Muslims. And those people who wrote about Malcolm, they didn't know Malcolm. So they have abstracted a journalistic uh, a narrative about his life as opposed to those who knew him to actually write about his transition as Muslim because you know that how many times you heard people trying to explain Islam that's not Muslim? You'd be like, oh my God, oh you got it all wrong. And that's what happened when they tried to articulate Malcolm's life. And my father actually wrote this book because First of all, Spike didn't cast me in the movie, okay? I was really upset. And I told my father, you need to do something about that. And I convinced him literally to sit down and write a book about I Barry Malcolm, the final chapter or the missing chapters, and he did that. And we sold the first edition out. And of course, with Black Lives Matter, the hype, and T for all these people pretending to be involved in the black, they disappeared upon the election. You know that, right? Anyway. But uh, we were, and, and Malcolm's was being used as a mascot in the wrong way, as a black nationalist, as a pan-Africanist, as an anti-Americanist, all these types of the hate mongers, things of this nature. And we wanted to reclaim Malcolm as a Muslim, to bring him back into our folds, into our ranks, and say, look, this man died upon ashhadu an la ilaha Allah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay, so if you look at the white cup book here, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, it has my father standing at the grave site of Malcolm. And it really doesn't validate Malcolm being a Muslim because, you know, it looks like a lot of people at his grave making supplications, you know, you don't know whether they're Muslims or not. So we was concerned about that. So we said, let's flip the cover and do the takbir, you know, to make it to erase all doubt. Because we know as Muslims, we can't pray over non-Muslims. So if my father is making takbir over Malcolm, that validates Malcolm being a Muslim. Malcolm, upon his assassination, was buried in the pages, the annuals of social justice. I can almost bet, and we don't gamble, that you did not hear about Malcolm before the 80s. Anyone heard about Malcolm before the 80s? In the 90s? Do you know it was the hip hop culture that brought Malcolm's consciousness back? Hmm? Because his book was, was, was uh, this car. They weren't in a lot of bookstores. They was banned, not even in the universities. You had to go to some alternative black ABC bookstore to get information about Malcolm because for 50 years he was the most hated and rejected personality in America. It's hard to believe that with the love we're showing him today. Okay, so my father, so I actually contributed two bonus chapters to Malcolm I Barrett because I wanted to show Malcolm's transition, him leaving off 
okay, and recanting much of what he said, and that's what Alex missed, the polemic chapters where Malcolm recanted much of what he believed in prior. That's not in the book, because Malcolm only had one session with Alex Haley when he made the pilgrimage, and of course his life ended shortly after that. My father, El Haji Sham Jabba, was the imam of the oldest indigenous Muslim community in America. We was conceived in 1936, and we was chartered in 1938. And our teacher, Muhammad Ezzedin, rahimallah, got his education from Al Azhar, and he was born in Abbeville, South Carolina. Okay? On the Sunnah. No transitions, no second resurrection, none of this stuff. Ayla al Sunnah. Okay? And, of course, we built our communities. As you can see, we, we actually built our masjids from the ground. And today, we retain 300 acres of land that we purchased in 1941. That's in West Valley, New York today. And we're getting ready to develop it for the Muslims. Okay? And also, my father, of course, uh, was a social activist. He cited in the current report the National Advisory Commission on Cis Civil Disorders. Uh, he stood between the writers. Uh, people that was getting ready to burn down the cities and the tanks flanked with National Guards when Mayor Don of my city, Elizabeth, New Jersey, had given his, his police and National Guards the order, shoot to kill. Of course, my father himself is cited in that particular book. And of course, Amir Barak, Leroy Jones, anyone heard of him? Uh, Ross Barak is the uh, mayor of uh, Newark, New Jersey. My father gave his father and his mother their shahada in his living room and also gave them their names, okay? Also, my father, Barrett Zay Shakur. Zay Shakur is the uncle of Tupac Shakur, and that's Tupac's grandfather, uh, uh, Salahuddin Shakur, and I was, I was actually uh, uh, um, cited or actually asked by his grandfather to actually counsel Tupac Shakur. Anyone know Tupac Shakur? Did you know that he had an Islamic background? It's just the streets got him, okay? And I couldn't get to him, okay? And I only met with him one time. But anyway, that's the legacy that's so tight and connected. And this is in 1971. We're talking about Palestine? Come on. 1971, we were standing at the United Nations Plaza in New York City saying, Palestine, Palestine for the Palestinian people. We've always championed uh, uh, those who have been down, tried to reject it, and deprived of their human rights. And of course, my father also established uh, institutes abroad. That is the school at the bottom. It is the uh, Jihad Institute in Morocco, Marrakesh. And that's where we actually took Americans in uh, and took them there to study Islam and so forth. And that's me on the right. I'm a lot younger there, as you can see. That was an academy that we used to run for young people. It was like boot camp. You know, when the parents had a bad apple in the bunch, <laughs> they would send them to me. Okay, and I would straighten them out. This is called boot camp. And of course, we was actually involved in the uh, Bano Sakar, that was the first Latino organized Muslim group in the northern region there. And we have uh, the uh, Alianza uh, uh, and the, uh, the three imams and so forth. They are off outgrowths of those uh, uh, efforts from my father, mashallah. And of course, who are aware of uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, show of hands, the Nation of Islam? I don't know what happened, but my father was his, his actual guide for Hajj in 1985. And also, my father, he worked for the Muslim World League for 15 years. He went to uh, Swaziland, South Africa. He was on Randers Island when Nelson Mandela went, Della was incarcerated there. And he gave 200 shadows to the Zulu nation, and they built seven masjids down there. This is the type of work that they will not tell you about. So now I'm going to ask you, do you really think you know Malcolm? OK. OK, let's continue. This is what they tell you about Malcolm. They wanted you to see out of the three hours and 27 minutes, the gigolo, you know, the Harlem hustle, you know, the number run and things like that, you know, the, sens the sensationalized life of Malcolm, and they played down his Islam. And of course, as we know, Malcolm reinvented himself more than one time. Malcolm, little child of tragedy. As we know, as Malcolm evolved, he actually was running from a horrific past. You know, his house been burned down when he was four years old. His father killed when he was six. Uh, his mother been committed to an insane asylum for 25 years of his life. Can you imagine that? You know, and he's just in a teenager, so he had a lot of problems. So when he actually uh, defected and went to the streets, like a lot of 
our youth are doing. They lose hope. They go to the streets, and they end up being incarcerated. Believe it or not, brothers and sisters, I have sit before young Muslims. I'm not talking about converts. Young Muslims who have a generation who cannot remember when there was non-Muslims in their family. They have come from Muslim countries that's on death row. That I'm sitting before these young men trying to tell them, you know, how to make the best of the moments that they have and to return to Allah in the best manner because it's a sealed deal because they went to the streets. And al Haj Malik Shabazz, he came out of the streets to Islam and we find our youth coming out of Islam going to the streets, the very opposite. And he joined the Nation of Islam. And I think, you know, when you look at it, you know, a person that experienced with Malcolm experience, uh, we went through a lot, you know, in the uh, Jim Crow South and all types of uh, racism. You, you have no idea. I mean, you read about racism, it's clean paper, there's no threat, you know, you know the, 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 the clubs that you see, law enforcement, with the, they don't jump off the page at you. But racism is real. You know, someone to, I mean, legislative from a state level to tell you on a day-to-day -day basis you're less than a human. You know what that does to a person's morale? You know, if, you weren't, if you're not strong, it will break you. It will send you to the streets. But it was Islam. I can say, alhamdulillah, al-Islam, because if it was not for Islam, I could have been uh, a statistic because I grew up in, in, in Brooklyn and I grew up in Jim Crow South and I could have taken uh, these matters in my own hands to try to seek limited revenge and I could have ended my life. Also, as we know, uh, the Nation of Islam was not true Islam. But let's talk about Malcolm's blunder. A case of the chickens coming home to roost. Okay, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, I mean, I mean, this is history, man. This is real history. I can recall the day that he was assassinated. We was in school, you know, they got everybody into the classroom and they made that a national day of mourning, okay? And Malcolm, uh, he said it was a case of chickens coming home to roost, which meant that the evil that you send out, it comes back to get you. What goes around, what? Comes around. And for that statement, he was silenced. And it wasn't from that statement because he was silenced. It was they was, Malcolm had outgrown the nation of Islam. He was looking at the broader spectrum of social justice, and he saw that the nation of Islam was not engaging. How many times, you know, your youth get so disappointed because uh, we old heads are not engaging? You're like, come on, you got to do something, okay? And... The nation of Islam was not engaged, and Malcolm had outgrown that. And of course, that was uh, the, the powers that be had told uh, the leader of the nation of Islam, you have to contain Malcolm. Okay? He's out of the straitjacket. And not only that, uh, Malcolm's sister, she made a comment. She said, I don't believe Elijah Muhammad would have suspended Malcolm for chickens coming to roost statement if he had been free to act on his own. By that time, Chicago crew had convinced him that Malcolm was a serious threat to the deal they had cut with the white supremacists and the money continued to pour in. That's what she said. And Malcolm himself said, in retrospect, I never seen a man in my life more afraid, more frightened than Elijah Muhammad when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Now imagine the platform that Malcolm preached upon. He was anti-American. He was a black nationalist. He was a pan-Africanist. He was a separatist. So he was just under the assumption that he was speaking for Elijah. But when he made that statement, he said Elijah Muhammad almost cracked up. And they say, we got to get rid of him. And of course, we know that at that particular time, that was not a good statement to make because Ghana, okay, and the United States of America had a, what we call a friendship, uh, 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 diplomatic relationship. And of course, saying that about Kennedy with the decolonization of Africa, it was not politically correct, and Malcolm wasn't aware of all these factors at that particular time, and of course he was kicked out, and once he was kicked out, he became public enemy number what? One. The opposition was from inside, the opposition was from outside, the opposition was abroad, Malcolm had three rings of evil around him, okay? 
And of course, Malcolm himself separated from the Nation of Islam. He established what we call the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Okay. Now, one thing, if you look at that paper, it says Malcolm X Little, okay, 1964, April 6th. And now you see his Shahada, it says Malik El Haj Shabazz, April 8, 1964. That's when he took his Shahada. Okay, and he went to Mecca. And of course, I remind you when Malcolm uh, uh, established the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, he did not abandon the theology of the Nation of Islam. He was still believing in that theology, but he was, he was actually thinking that he could do more as an independent entity and engage more in the civil rights movement with, without having uh, the constraints of the Nation of Islam over him. And it was in Mecca itself when he was in Ihram, actually in the sacred garment himself, when he decided that he would be a Muslim. And he made a decision, and of course he wrote a letter back. And okay, I'm just going to read one part there. And it says, you may be shocked by these words coming from me. Okay, why would Malcolm say that? Why would he write this letter back to his organization and say, you may be shocked by these words coming from me? Because when Malcolm left, he left as a black nationalist. He left as a pan-Africanist. He left as a separatist. But when he got into Mecca, he had his epiphany. And he truly accepted Islam. And he sent the letter back, and it was intercepted by James 67X, his secretary. And James 67X hid that letter for a week because he was afraid to present it to the community because they felt they had lost what? Their Malcolm. And that's why he wrote that letter. And upon them hearing that, a lot of the members who had defected from the Nation of Islam to join Malcolm, they defected from Malcolm and went back and joined what? The Nation of Islam. So now you see that's why. And of course, Malcolm said he felt that he was the only uh, Hajj from America at that time. And he wasn't aware that we, my father had made Hajj in 1962. He was the youngest Hajji in America at that time. We had brothers who made it in 1952. Uh, in 57, so there was many, many hajj. It would show you how isolated Malcolm was in his very initial struggle for Islam. And of course, he established the OAU, uh, and that organization was very unique because it gave him a platform to engage with the civil rights movement. And there was a plan put together for Malcolm and Martin Luther King to come together to collaborate on the social justice movement that would have brought <laughs> America to its knees. And of course, they could not have that. And they did everything in their power to keep Malcolm and Martin apart. And you'll see that in the next book coming up, Who Really Killed Malcolm. Every time Malcolm would go to uh, Georgia, do you know Dr. King would be arrested and put in jail? If you look at the timing, they never, they only met one time, and that was just, how you doing? Nice to meet you, and bye. And I'm not going to get into DeBerry. He was the first uh, uh, so-called African-American to run for president of America before Obama and before Jesse Jackson and before Al Sharpton. He ran for president in 1963 on a socialist platform. I don't know if any politicians or sociologists in here, but that's something you need to think about. And these are some of the powerful heads of states that Malcolm met when he was in Africa. And that's why... His vision for social justice was not limited to America, and he was trying to get a platform, okay, to go to the United Nations and indict America, not for civil rights violation, but for human rights violation. And you needed a sovereign nation to give you a platform to be able to do that, and Malcolm has set that up, and of course, he became a bigger threat, so forth and so on. So, of, of course, I'm going to stop right here. Um, most of this stuff is in the book. If it's not in this book, it'll be in the next book, okay? <laughs> inshallah ta'ala. So I'm going to take some questions, inshallah, uh, about uh, some of the things we talk about. And let's kind of like keep it around Malcolm's life. And, uh, of course, I want to be able to answer the question within two minutes, you know, uh, of response. I don't want to just elaborate too long about it. I want to give everybody a chance to ask a question, inshallah. So I'm going to start with who had the most numbers, the sisters, inshallah. Okay? Yes. Oh, I buried Malcolm. I, I, I actually redid this book in honor of my father and to actually capture 
uh, the Malcolm as a Muslim. It's very important because in this book, my father set the platform of what is a Muslim. Because if people say, oh, Malcolm was a Muslim, then what, what are the beliefs of a Muslim? You know, we, so he actually kind of set the, the tone for what is a Muslim, and then he inserted his involvement with Malcolm and what transpired, the threats that went down, not just from an internal level, but from a state, state department level. That's why you see only one person standing at, the, at, at Malcolm's coffin with one guy accompanying him because all of the heads of states from the African countries was given orders by the state department do not attend his funeral. So, and of course, some of that is in the book and also the legacy of Haji Sham Jabba, who picked up the mantle after Malcolm was assassinated and continued the social justice struggle. And we have 617 declassified FBI files on our organization. So you will see that's the reason why no one heard about us. We were suppressed. But the Malcolm I kill is the trial. It's those eyewitnesses that did not testify who actually saw the victims, the assassins, but they was actually put in different parts of the country so that they wouldn't be called to testify. So I cover that. Yes. Brother over here, yes. So back in the you know, when when they took the what like in there were like these mounds that were being dug and they pulled like the bones out and they were just like they threw them away. Was there like a number of them? Like what what was actually going on? Wow, that's a good question. Where were the Muslims from the Levant? Uh first and foremost, uh the only the Muslims from the Levant, Turkey, could come to America with the Naturalization Act. The Arabs from the Khalij and Yemen and North Africa would not allow citizenship. Okay, now what happened is we had something called segregation. See, when we talk about segregation, it doesn't mean like a petition like this. Segregation was legislation. Case in point, if you were white and own a restaurant, and if a colored, as they classified them, then came in and sat down, not only would the person who's eating in that restaurant be in violation, but the person who allowed him to sit down would be cited as a violation. If, in fact, I sat at the front of the bus and the bus driver didn't move me to the back, the bus driver would lose his job and he would be fined. So to try to integrate at any level was a violation. It was a civil offense. The, one, the Muslims who came from the Levant, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, you know, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, they had to be reclassified as whites. They couldn't come in as Arabs or Palestinians. I, as I mentioned, there were three types of people in America, black, whites, and the other. Okay, that was the Asians and so forth. So, they could not engage at a certain level, but you know, they clandestinely, they kind of like in and out. That's why when al Hajj Malik Shabazz was assassinated, Imam uh, Dr. Shawarabi was, he did not go to the Janazza. When they called the, the Islamic Center of New York, all they got was a, a continuous ring. None of the diplomats from, from, of the, from the embassies came to attend his Janazza. So they was actually, mar they were marginalized. Anti-messenger nation laws prevented a colored and a white from even marrying. If you marry someone out of what they call your race, and we know there's only one race, then you would go to prison for marrying someone other than your race. So the Muslims who come from the Levant were, were, were marginalized, and they could not engage. That's why you find the Sudanese like uh, uh, Sayyidi Majid, uh, those, uh, 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 Muhammad Ali, people of color was able to integrate with the colors without being recognized to that extent and help them with Islam. But no, the Levants, they couldn't, they couldn't get involved because of legislation. Yes. Yes. Excellent question. 
why did Malcolm start his own organization without assimilating with the present Muslim communities at that particular time? And was his uh, theology uh, Sunni or did he maintain some of the residue of the nation of Islam, et cetera? All of the above, <laughs> okay? Now, when al Haj Malik Shabazz accepted Islam, he established the Muslim Mosque Incorporated before he took Shahada. So, and the theology of the Muslim Mosque Incorporated was the exact same as that of the Nation of Islam. He went to Mecca, and he, that was his conversion. And when he came back, that's when he made the transition. And Malcolm himself said, I'm not, I'm not coming back to start a new religion of my own. I'm, he was, he, it was a, a transitional process. That's why Sheikh Ahmed Hassoun from Sudan, who taught 33 years in Mecca, was assigned to him as a personal teacher to come back and teach them. That's why uh, Malcolm would go to 72nd Street and make the Jumu'ah Salah. That's why my father, along with Sheikh Dao Faiz and other of the Aimma, would actually help Malcolm in that transition. But Malcolm could not come right into the Sunni Muslim because it was conflict. You know, and, and again, Malcolm was only in the country about six months after his Shahada. All the other time he was out. So he didn't have time to put it together. But his aqidah was la ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah. He himself said, I'm a Muslim that follow Muhammad Sallallahu and I have his shahada vocalized. We have the taping of him actually saying the shahada. So we are clear that he was a Sunni Muslim. And that's the only reason my father would go and champion him, even though his life was being threatened, because Malcolm was first put in a, 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 um, a Western suit. And he stayed in, in state for until that Friday. He was assassinated that Sunday. He was stayed in state until that Friday. Sheikh Ahmed Hassoun took him out of the Western suit. He washed him, shrouded him, and sent it to him. And he told my father, I can't go any further. You have to take it from here. So my father took it from there. And there's a picture, I didn't show it on here, where you, know, you, 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 you fight fire with fire. So not only uh, were we prepared for uh, uh, from hostilities, but we were prepared to actually return the same results if they were to attack my father. Yes. Um, let me get him, then I'll come right back. Yes. There was, there was segregating. Um, even though we were fighting for desegregation, the Nation of Islam was promoting segregation. It's, that's kind of what we're looking at, right? Do you know that the Nation of Islam was actually being supported by an oil baron by the name of H.L. Hunt, who actually funneled money into the Nation of Islam because what that separation and uh, agenda of the Nation of Islam was actually reinforcing the segregation uh, ideals of the South. So there was, and also the, they had a pact with the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. I don't know if you heard of the Ku Klux Klan. They're still around. They wear police uniforms today in the South. They sit on the, on the bench and judge. They're still there. They just don't have the hoods, okay? They wear badges now. But anyway, <laughs> now, uh, so they had actually cut a deal with the Nation of Islam to give them a, 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 a track of land. Okay, so they could go there and set up a separate state to create the illusion that being separate was a progressive move for the blacks at that time. Okay, so that's why Malcolm stood on the soap boxes in Harlem for 10 years and no one touched him. And he was teaching uh, the white man was the devil, literally saying that he was evil in his intrinsic nature and no one touched him. For 10 years, but as soon as he said, I shadow in la illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, I'm a, I, I believe in humanity, that all, everyone uh, uh, are equal, that we have to judge them by their content or their character, not by their complexion. He removed all the racial content. What happened? He became public enemy number one. Okay, and I want to take, I got it. I'm going to take him and I'll take you, sister. Yes? Okay, subhanAllah. Um, no, no, I, I love that question because I want to answer it, you know, in, in the right way. We haven't completed our struggle. The question was, 
how can we learn from the lessons of those uh, that preceded us, their struggles and their sacrifices, and, and their contribution? What can we gain from that? And I'm saying that to say that we have not finished the struggle. Okay, we still have systemic racism, marginalization. It's actually hidden now. It's actually, you know, in, in, in corporate America now. It's actually taking a corporate image, okay? And you see deprivation, you know, of that same people who came by way of the African diaspora still being marginalized, okay? We have not been able to be, uh, uh, receive reparation for 319 years of servitude of free labor. So that's why you see that segment of the society is still lagging behind. And it's a matter of losing hope. But what we can learn is that we should never give up. And we should also realize that those freedom fighters and those people who came through the front lines, they gave their lives. Mega Evers, Dr. King, Malcolm X, many of them, uh, uh, Lamuma Shakur, Zay Shakur, right, wrong, and different, they was fighting against injustice, okay? And we have to be willing to sacrifice. Malcolm himself was given a doll for his daughters, dolls for his daughters. And you know what Malcolm said? He said, I never had an opportunity to buy a toy for my children. You know, I mean, they almost didn't know Malcolm had a personality. He was on the go so much. So the thing is that we, in, 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 when you're going to embark upon something of that nature, you have to be willing to sacrifice to get results. So I think that's the resilience that, the res, uh, resilience that, that was instilled in that civil rights movement, that these people came out, Dr. King came out, Malcolm came out, Mega Evers came out, my father came out, Dr. Uh, 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 Sheikh uh, Ahmed Faisal came out. They came to the front line and they faced the enemy and they influenced legislation. But what happened is, and we can't be on the take, I, you know, the, the millions of dollars that was put on in front of them to compromise. Of course, a lot of them took the money, okay, and they killed the movement, but there were many who would not take any money to compromise the struggle for social justice. No compromise and do not stop in the middle of the mission and be willing to sacrifice. That's what we need to learn from that. Yes, sister. Yes. The first one, uh, Abdullah, you can pull the mic anytime you get ready, okay? Okay, okay, inshallah. I see him going to it. He's getting ready to pull the plug, but no, but listen, yes. Uh, yes, he actually recanted. He actually rejected it, you see, and what happened was Malcolm was so disappointed. That's why I say when you read Alice Haley's book, he doesn't put the polemic verse chapters in there, meaning Malcolm's new position. Malcolm was so hurt that he had taught 10 years of falsehood. He was so hurt that he had deprived the people of the luxury of being Muslim. He said, only if Elijah had taught Islam, we would be way ahead of ourselves. We would cease to be the minority and become the majority because at that time we had 800 million Muslims that we could have joined, but yet we wanted to be the minority of two or 300,000. Yes. 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 Malcolm said, I'm no longer a, a, a racist. I'm no longer a black nationalist. I'm no longer a pan-Africanist. I am a Muslim. Huh? And you know, when Malcolm was out there in, in, in Algeria, he was actually traveling in Africa, and he was, he was pumping that, that, that black nationalist stuff, you know? And uh, he met an Algerian and said, yo, Malcolm, we're all fighting for the same thing. You know, if you're going to racialize your struggle, what does this say for the Algerians? What does this say for the people in, you know, in, 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 the, in Asia? And Malcolm had to rethink. See, Malcolm had to, to unload a lot of stuff, you know, because what happened was, and then now you had the Muslims pulling on him. As you know, Africa, when they went through decolonization, when they left the British, they also, they adopted the socialist platform. So Malcolm was being pulled from that. So he never endorsed socialism as a platform when he came back. He was just trying to find a workable solution with using Islam as the moral compass and also being able to engage, you know, with the social justice movement of people of color who's being oppressed. And that's why he established the Organization for Afro-American Unity, so it can be inclusive. Because the problem that we faced in America was not limited to religion. You know, because the black Christians, they had their churches bombed. 
the black ministers was hanged just like the Muslim. So there was no discrimination in your religion. It was about your ethnicity. And Malcolm saw that we cannot have uh, religious freedom until we have ethnic freedom. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, yes. Uh, also, uh, yeah, I'm going to sell my book, and they won't buy the book if I keep talking, right? Okay, I have the book, okay? It's, it's, and this book, uh, I Buried Malcolm, and what we are trying to do actually is to create an encyclopedia for the early presence of Islam in America. And, of course, the proceeds from this book funds that project, okay? So we don't have uh, uh, petrol uh, dollars in our account. So this is what we do. We're in the grind. And of course, it's a good reader, 255 pages. It has a pictorial uh, appendix with footnotes, and, it, and it's a very good piece of material, inshallah. So we have them uh, downstairs if they want to get them, inshallah. Okay? Jazakallah khair. Okay? So, alhamdulillah, uh, he's pulling the mic. Uh, <laughs> okay? But alhamdulillah, look, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I used to be probably the youngest among these type of congregations. And I am, you know, I think I'm anyone here 70. I win today. I win today, okay? Uh, I do the hijra. You know, hijra, I, gotta, I get an extra edge. You know, the women that don't like to deal with the hijra calendar, you know, they stay the Gregorian when it comes to age. Anyway, so I'm very inspired. I see hope in the young people when I see young Muslims, you know, uh, who, who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who actually have their sights on the akhirah, that this dunya is only a sabab, a means to get to the, to the next life, it gives me hope. You know, I'm, I, I have 13, uh, 12 children survived. I, I, Allah, two of them returned to Allah, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I have 21 grandchildren, and, and I want them to be integrated uh, with the Muslim ummah, and, uh, and that's how we operate from henceforth, inshallah. And I'm not going to tell them about my grandfather coming to America as a slave at nine years old. He was captured in Mali, okay? He was captured in Mali, came to America, and he was enslaved until he was 50 years old, and that's when he married, and that's how I end up coming through my uh, great-grandfather Lawrence, mashallah. Salam alaikum. Jazakum Allah khairan. Jazakum Allah khairan, Sheikh Muhammad Jabir. If I could just have everyone's attention just for a few quick announcements. The first is, as Sheikh Mohammed Jabir mentioned, the book is available downstairs as you guys are exiting. There's a full table set up for you to buy it, inshallah. So please make sure to purchase it for yourself or for your family members that you want to gift it to on your way out because it's important that we preserve legacies like, Sheikh, like, um, like Brother Malcolm X's and many others throughout our history, not only for the Muslim Ummah, but across the world as well. A few important announcements. As we mentioned, we're entering the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Yes, there's a huge debate whether today was the last 10 nights or not. Sheikh Bedoui cleared this up. Tomorrow is the first of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. It's the 21st night. And so with that, brothers and sisters, let me just get your attention really quick. Every single night, we'll be having a halaqa at 11.30. And then we'll be having our first tahajjud at 1 a.m., our second tahajjud at 3 a.m., and then Salatul Fajr will be 20 minutes after Adhan. With that, you, got, you guys all have seen, both brothers and sisters, the benefit of having an expansion project. And we don't have to talk about the, the three different floors, the potential of it, the classrooms, and so on. But what I want everyone here to do, I know the majority here are college students or paying off some debt in some type of way, is make an intention to either donate yourself or to create a fundraiser for your center. Alhamdulillah, right now and this year specifically, we created a specific opportunity for anyone that fundraises through the masjid, inshallah, there's a link available on our launch tree, where when you click on it, you could create your own fundraising campaign, and the top three winners will be getting prizes. The first winner, the person that raises the highest amount of money, will be, get a will be getting a fully paid Umrah trip, inshallah, in 2025. So brothers and sisters, this is your opportunity to get a fully paid for Umrah, if you just fundraise for your center through your link. And if you're not able to do that, make sure that you make the intention of donating something to your masjid as it is your local community center. And we know the importance of local community. With that also as well, tomorrow, 12 o'clock, City Hall. Tomorrow is land day for Palestine. And so what that means is we need to come out. Malcolm X, as, as, as along with many others, was on the front lines about talking about Palestine 
was very big about talking about anti-imperialist struggles. And so for us to be at the front lines is to follow in the legacy of Malcolm X. And so brothers and sisters, take today's talk as an action item to show up tomorrow for land day, to show up for protests for Palestine and for other anti-imperialist movements. And please continue to donate generously for your center. Sisters can stay on this floor, inshallah, as sisters will be having their qiyam. Brothers, please head downstairs. Jazakumullah khairan. And finally, subhanakallahu wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.